thank you so much for coming. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, what a stimulating drive down the uh, turnpike from Tulsa that was. <laughs> I, I can't decide if the Cimarron or the Turner are more numbing after about the 30th minute. There's nothing to look at. I'm just driving this drool coming out of my mouth. And we used to come out here. A buddy of mine was uh, a student at OSU back in 1986 and 87. He had, a, he had an apartment, uh, Apple Creek Apartments over on Perkins Road. I don't even know if it's still there or not. Yeah? And uh, we, uh, we'd go to the car mic. And so coming back here brings back a lot of memories. Of course, in 25 years, this town's changed. <laughs> There's so much more stuff. But uh, I know a lot of you are, are students. I know a lot of people have uh, sort of braved uh, the turnpike and, and other highways and byways to, to be a part of the evening, and I'm so glad you're here. I also understand that there may be some folks here who are believers uh, or religious in some way, and I want you to know that you are most welcome here. This is not a hostile environment for the religious. Um, I was a, a, a believer in the Christian God for 30 years, and I will tell you right off the bat that, that uh, tonight I will go after the dogma. I will go after the... the um, the holy the foundational document, the holy book. I will go after many of the things that religion does. Please, if I may implore you, don't take it personally. I'm not going after you. Uh, and the second thing is, is be skeptical of everything I say. Don't take it at face value, please. If I say something inflammatory or provocative or something that just doesn't wash, fine, please. We live in a society where you can go and look it up. I would encourage you to find out and check it. And if I'm wrong, I'm the first that would want to know about it. Fair enough? Yep. Fair enough? Yes, are. Wow. It's a little warm in here. I feel like Nixon during his debate with JFK, you know, as the sweat comes down. So, I mean, the only, the only towel I could find was one of those little cheap uh, brown little things. So I'm going to kind of dab with it until things cool down. So bear with me. After tonight's event, I want to encourage all of you to join me in uh, something special. We're going to commemorate the, uh, the cult of... Hono Hana Sampoyo. Say it together with me. Hono Forget it. You kill it. <laughs> you may not have known this, but your feet are the window to the soul. Hona Hana Sampoyo is a foot reading cult. It was made in 1987 by a Japanese guy named Hogan Fukunaga. Now he claimed he could diagnose illness and determine your spiritual health by reading your feet. Fukunaga said he had a spiritual event, that he was the reincarnation of Christ and Buddha. And his divine insight would allow him to read your feet for the meager fee of $900 a session. Are we in the wrong business? <laughs> How many people think this sounds ridiculous? Just give me some hands just so I have some validation up here. Thank you. All right. Well, it wasn't all that ridiculous to the nearly 30,000 people who were members of this particular cult not so long ago. Ultimately, the church splintered out. Uh, the founder, go figure, was accused of scamming money from housewives and had to pay over a million dollars in damages. Anyway, after the presentation tonight, I just want to extend a personal invitation. We'll hang out together. We'll read each other's feet, you know. No? That's ridiculous? Okay. Yet millions of people believe that their futures can be told by reading palms, the turning of the card, the tea leaves, the crystal ball, and other powerful tools, tools of the uh, fortune teller. Some people in this world practice felidomancy. I don't know if I'm even saying it right. Felidomancy? Philidomancy? It's obviously a, a, a derivative of feline. Observing the way your cat moves or jumps around the house. Any cat owners? You have a fortune-telling device in your home. You can even tell the weather 
by watching your cat. How about molosophy? <laughs> your mole says a lot about you. You have a mole on or near your belly button, it means you want children. A mole on your butt, you're lazy and not very ambitious. <laughs> what are you nodding for? She's like, yeah. A mole on your back means you are rather unreliable. Moles on the ears are considered lucky. A mole on the elbow indicates a love of travel and adventure. And a mole on your fingers means that you are dishonest. There are other methods for fortune telling, including one that reads your urine. I am not making this up. It's called uromancy, the interpretation of the bubbles in your urine <laughs> to reveal future events. The bubbles are big and spaced far apart. Good things are coming. <laughs> if they're small and close together, something terrible like the death of a loved one or illness may be just around the corner. Now, I know all of you secretly at the urinal or wherever tonight will be thinking about this. <laughs> Many who would never get a palm reading or a pee reading because it's ridiculous will daily read their horoscopes. Anybody know anybody who reads horoscopes? I have never understood this. I mean, they plan their days and destinies around these small paragraphs written in newspapers and in magazines, websites, wherever. You know, they're everywhere, right? The paragraphs they live their lives by are often unsigned by the authors. Have you noticed that? If you're an Aries, if you're a Pisces, whatever, this will happen. But the horoscopes are unsigned. Who wrote them? I don't know, but I know they're true. My destiny is written in the stars. One of my favorites was, uh, this is just a random web page I picked up. I was looking at the, uh, the column on the left. You can check numerology, rune cast, animal spirits, suburban baby names, excuse me, <laughs> signs of the zodiac. And my favorite, Gong He Fat Choi. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You know, when I was a Christian, we used to mock astrology and fortune telling, right? That was ridiculous. That's stupid. We spoke out vocally against psychics and soothsayers of all shapes and sizes. But we were doing the same thing with the Christian Bible that they do with horoscopes. You walk up to a Christian, ask him if, if the Bible is accurate and true. And I'd say at least eight times out of ten, let's call it seven times out of ten, you'll get a yes, the Bible is true, it's accurate, historical accurate, morally accurate, right? Uh, it, it is absolutely infallible, perfect, the divinely inspired word of God. The book of Revelation is a fortune-telling book. It posits wild scenarios, 24 crowned elders, the four beasts, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the seven angelic trumpeters, scorpion-tailed locusts, the beast of the sea with seven heads, ten horns, the dragon, the whore of Babylon, the new heaven, the new earth, wild stuff, well beyond you will have a fortuitous day at the office, right, that you might read at a horoscope. This is really out there. Some's literal, sure, some symbolism, fine. But everything in Revelation is fortune-telling. It's the future foreseen from thousands of years ago. And who wrote it? It says in Revelation 1.9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos. So it's John of Patmos. But even the experts, the apologists, who I don't know about you, drive me freaking crazy, can't agree on who John is. Who's, what's the source? Was it John of Patmos? Was he a new character in scripture? Somebody we hadn't heard of before? Was it the figure that apologists called John the Elder? Was it John the Apostle? Was it John Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You want to have some fun? Put a hundred apologists, experts, in the room and have them talk about who authored the book of Revelation. They will chew each other up. 
These are the experts. And yet it's a pretty rudimentary question, right? It's the book of Revelation, the ultimate horoscope. And as a former believer, I assure you, you have every right when you hear a believer posit the book of Revelation, which is like, what did Julius Sweeney say? It was like uh, the ultimate acid trip. If, if you read it, <laughs> woo! Uh, I'm paraphrasing her, but uh, she has a great bit on Revelation in her uh, stand-up called Letting Go of God. It's way out there. Next time a believer in Christ posits this as truth, just remind them they're just reading a horoscope. I did a podcast on cults and strange religious practices last year. Do any of you listen to the actual radio podcasts? Thank you. I take a lot of heat for not doing videos all the time. They're much harder to do with my schedule lately. They're just harder to, to get produced. The podcast also is the one time of the week that I can sit down and connect with other like-minded people. I, like you, live in Oklahoma. I don't rub elbows with people who necessarily jive with my worldview. They go to church every Sunday. So it is so refreshing to be able to sit down and just have a conversation, to be able to interact with people who are skeptics. Even when we disagree, it's in a different way, and it's so refreshing. But we did a podcast recently, and we talked about a ritual conducted by Orthodox Jews. It's called Copper Rope. You guys ever heard of it? <coughs> in this ceremony, you transfer your own sins out of your body and into an animal, specifically a live chicken. Here's how it works. <laughs> you take the chicken. You hold the chicken in front of your face and you move it around your face three times. Two, three. This transfers the sin from you into the chicken. You also must recite a scripture. You read aloud the, uh, the words. There's another photograph of a bird just about to be killed uh, in the name of atonement. You read the words of uh, Psalm 107, 17 through 20. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. You say this verse out loud. You may also follow it up with Job 33, 23, and 24. I won't bother reading it here. After you read that scripture, you grab the chicken by the shoulder blades and you go three times in front of your face, right? This transfer the sin from you to the chicken, then you kill the chicken. Then you donate it to the poor and they eat the chicken. Which raises the question, if you eat a chicken that's full of evil, <laughs> do you have to then go out and get a fresh chicken and do the procedure all over again? You've reinfected yourself with sin. Ridiculous, you say? Barbaric and stupid, you say? Well, the concept of atonement is biblical. Book of Leviticus, the sins of the Israelites transferred to the tabernacle by the blood of the sacrifices. And God's instruction to Moses... Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take... Two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other for the scapegoat. By the way, that's where we get the word scapegoat. They would take two goats, they'd sacrifice one, and the other one full of sin or whatever would be sent out into the wilderness to starve to death. The Day of Atonement, a high priest would transfer the accumulated sin into a live goat, the goat driven into the desert to die. The children of Israel were cleansed. In the New Testament, this is exactly what Jesus did for all of humankind. By the way, I stole this from the uh, two-hour episode of torture porn from Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. <laughs> when I was a believer, they thought that film was going to change the world. Mel Gibson made appearances in churches all around the nation, I believe all around the world. People had revival services, people brought them together, churches held special screenings of the Passion. They would rent out movie theaters and we would all go and see the Passion. It was essentially two hours of Jesus Christ getting the shit kicked out of him. And at 
at the end, there was almost no payoff, right? You saw him stand up and walk away. And it was at that moment that everybody was supposed to be ready for then the church or whoever to go in and bring that message home. Would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior or whatnot? Of course, we all know how that turned out. The film made a lot of money, but in the end, you can see where Mel Gibson's credibility, unfortunately, has gone. And the film itself has not fared much better. Atonement, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines atonement as the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, reparation for an offense or injury, satisfaction. The Moody Bible Institute's own statement of belief lines up with the majority of mainstream Protestant churches with the declaration that Christ's death was more than an attempt to reverse the human course started by Adam. It served as a substitute payment for the trespasses of all mankind. It's not enough just to be forgiven, right? Humankind needed substitutionary atonement. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's like a global Christian version of Copper Row. And Jesus is the chicken. <laughs> or the goat. Or the cow. Or the ram. The sins transferred out of us into the body of another, and then the other is killed. Now, as a believer, if you told me about Copa Rosa chicken, I'd have said, that's ridiculous, but I was perfectly willing to accept that same scenario, with the sacrifice being a God-man described in an ancient book written by people we can't even identify. How many people in this room are animal lovers, like me? Right. You're going to hate this next one. <laughs> I didn't bring the video of it because, quite frankly, I couldn't bear to watch it, but I brought some stills. It's called Treachin. Dog spinning. This is an absolutely true practice. Made popular in southeastern Bulgaria, a ritual from a pagan practice performed once a year on March 15th. That's tomorrow, by the way. To prevent rabies and bring about good luck it requires suspending a dog by rope over a body of water. You tie a rope around the dog's waist. You then turn the dog in a single direction and you twist the rope so that it becomes tightly wound. You then unwind the rope and the dog spins wildly in the opposite direction as the cord unwinds. The dogs fall into the water and are so often so dizzy and disoriented that they drown. But hey, as long as the evil spirits are appeased, that's the most important thing. Who believes that this is reasonable? None of you. Who believes it is cruel and sad and ridiculous? Everybody. And here in the Midwest, that is the answer you will get from the Protestant Christian community, my former community of believers. That's just nuts. It's terrible. It's pathetic. It's abuse. It's, it's unimaginable. With that in mind, let us explore a beloved passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 8. When he, Jesus, arrived at the other side in the region of Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us, please, into the herd of pigs. And he said, go. And they came out and went into the pigs, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and died in the water. Now the pigs, just like the dogs, hadn't done anything wrong. They were just doing what pigs do. They're just hanging out. Jesus infected them with evil and drowned them in the lake. The spinning dogs drowning in the river, well, that's abusive and ridiculous and crazy and nuts and should be stopped at all costs. But the pig story, well, that's a celebration of God's power <laughs> over Satan. By the way, some good news about Trechin. The practice was banned officially in 2005 for being, cruelty to animal, for being cruel to animals. The bad news is, is that there are rogue elements that still practice it. In fact, I believe last week somebody was actually caught and will face prosecution for doing it. They just set these things up at random. Some people spin the dogs without a rope off of bridges. They believe it brings them luck and good fortune. 
No cruelty at the uh, Karni Mata Temple in northwestern India. They love animals, specifically rats. You should see the look on your faces. Inside this holy church dedicated to the 15th century incarnation of the Hindu goddess Durga, about 20,000 rats roam the church freely. It is believed they're not just rodents. They're reincarnations of dead people who eventually will be reborn as higher life forms. Given plenty of milk and special treats, and before you walk inside, you are required to remove your shoes and let the rodents run across your feet. I think I could do it. <laughs> you never know till you get there, because I mean, rats don't freak me out too bad. But you know, I mean, 20,000 of them, and they're running rampant, and they run across your feet? How many of you think you could allow a few thousand rats to run across your feet? I got, I got about 12 people, 12 brave souls here. Now, how many of you believe that the rat is the physical manifestation of a spirit being? It's a vehicle for the, for the, uh, the spirit, the soul. I'm taking that as a zero. But again, within the Christian faith, my own foundational document had lots of animals possessed with spiritual power. Numbers 22, God gives Balaam's donkey the power to talk in Balaam's native tongue. The chapter before, the Lord sent fiery serpents to bite people after they were disobedient. And Moses eventually constructed a serpent made of brass and he erected it on a big pole so whoever looked up would not die. 2 Kings chapter 2, God used two she-bears, not just bears, she-bears, to maul a group of kids who made fun of Elijah's bald head. I did, a, I did a video on this. If you get a chance, go watch it. It's called The Bald Avenger. In Genesis, a dove intelligently went on recon missions to help Noah find dry land after the great flood. Can we digress for a second? God and Noah were on speaking terms when he built the ark, right? God told him right down to how many cubits it needed to be. So at the end of the story, Noah is resorting to sending a dove out to go see if there's land. He and God are buds, <laughs> you know? Why not look up and go, hey, yo, just point me in the right direction, please. Save me a month or two of floating around here in the abyss. Fish miraculously knew to swim into the disciples' fishing nets in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus instructed them to let down the nets. Now, Protestant Christians laughed laugh at the temple of rats, but they embrace biblical stories of animals imbued with spiritual intelligence or spiritual guidance. In a few extreme places, some here in Oklahoma, as I understand it, we have some Pentecostal churches that invite congregation members to pick up and handle the snake. You guys heard of this? Snake handlers say they're following instructions from the Bible, particularly a verse, Mark 16, 18, which says, Believers shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And judging by the fatality statistics, this ain't working out so good. <laughs> More than 100 people have died handling snakes, apparently because they didn't have enough faith. Can you imagine being in one of those services? First of all, everybody's jumping the pew and they've got the tambourine and the piano and the organ and they bring out the snake. Then somebody gets bitten. Then they drop him to the stage and instead of calling the paramedic, people come and gather around and lay on some hands and pray for Jesus to come and, and heal him and the guy freaking dies. <laughs> Is that a Darwin Award or what? <laughs> I mean, it's tragic. It's tragic. But I'm just saying, you know, when I look around at this crazy world sometimes, I just think to myself, sometimes you got to thin the herd, you know? I mean, sometimes some, some people are taking up air. It's amazing what people do in the name of belief to honor their deities or bring about good fortune. Like in the city of Solapur, once a year, local Muslims and Hindus commemorate the tradition of baby tossing. <laughs> To bring about good luck, they take babies to the tops of 50-foot buildings and they drop them into a stretched sheet below. They do this to bring about good luck. How about Haunin Matsuri, it's the Japanese fertility festival, where once a year, residents 
carry a long wooden penis through the middle of town <laughs> to ensure fertility among the residents and a bountiful harvest of food. Imagine looking out your window and seeing that. <laughs> Did you know that there's an actual religion called Jediism? Yeah. Yeah. This is not a fan club, just a fan club, by the way. You're thinking, oh, they're all just Star Wars fans. No, 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 this is an actual religion. They believe in the force, the energy that holds the universe together and flows through every living thing. Jediism draws from a number of religious philosophies, including Christianity, Stoicism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Shintoism. Jedis live by something called the Orthodox Jedi Code. And it reads, in fact, let's read it together. There is no emotion, there is peace. No, you got to feel it. Come on. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death. There is the force. I feel its presence right now, don't you? It's actually recognized by the military. The Jediism religion is recognized by the U.S. military? Well, I hope they take, uh, you know, an AR-15 instead of a lightsaber into combat because... <laughs> I'm just saying. Makes more sense than the Church of Scientology which posits that 75 million years ago, Xenu, the intergalactic overlord, was responsible for life essences called thetans or thetans existing in each and every one of our human bodies desperate to be freed using auditing sessions that will cost you up to $1,000 an hour. Now, when I was a believer, you could have asked me, do you believe, Seth, that your body's a shell for an orb of energy brought here by Xenu, the intergalactic overlord, and you should pay the Church of Scientology to help free it? I'd have kicked you out of the house, right? It's ridiculous. But as a Christian, I believe my earthly body was a shell for an eternal soul and that an all-powerful God-man visited Earth 2,000 years ago to save it, and I could only be freed by reciting an incantation, prayer of acceptance. Christianity, to me, made sense. Scientology and all the other cults, ridiculous. Don't think you're immune to the ridiculous. We accept ridiculous things every day throughout our culture. You can walk down to Barnes & Noble and pick up the latest hardcover nonfiction book. Make it a history book. It's a book about a historical figure written by a celebrated author with a global marketing campaign. What do you pay for it? 20, 25 bucks? On your Kindle, it's probably half that. Go to your college bookstore, pick up a history book where the information has barely changed in, oh, let's call it five years. How much do you pay for that? 150, 200, 300 bucks for a college book? How much do you guys pay for yours? About 150. I was kind of researching kind of where college textbooks had gone. There's actually been studies about the most ex expensive textbooks in the country. The most expensive one being $1,500 for one book. Another example in the marketplace. This is the uh, Texas Instruments TI-30 X2S scientific calculator. Features a multi-line 10-digit screen. It's good for basic math, as well as calculating statistics and advanced scientific functions. It's ideal for algebra, geometry, trigonometry, statistics, and science. Retail price, $20.33. This is a cell phone case, otherwise known as a piece of colored plastic <laughs> that does nothing. $34.95. What do you think? Ridiculous? Yes. Yeah. It's not just the things we buy. It's the things we do. We say ridiculous things like, I literally laughed out loud. As opposed to what? I symbolically, I figuratively, I, 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 of course you literally laughed out loud. You laughed out loud in the literal sense. We write things like, it goes without saying. And then we say it. <laughs> Guilty. Anybody else ever done that? It goes without saying. It's 
It's one of the best places to eat in Stillwater. Well, if it goes without saying, you don't have to say it. We have rules for our language, like in grammar. I before E, except after C. Except when it's not. <laughs> Here are some examples of words that totally break that rule. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We pronounce the word knife, but we spell it with a K. We use a language where the word abbreviation has 12 letters and five syllables. We use a language where the double O in book is pronounced differently than the double O in bloom, which is pronounced differently than the double O in floor, which is pronounced differently than the double O in flood. But we write it and we say it every day. We don't even blink. Ridiculous? I think so. We live in a culture where they build million dollar skyscrapers using the latest technology, the latest advancements, climate control systems through the roof, high-tech stabilization systems that protect them against earthquakes, inventive floor plans developed with state-of-the-art architectural tools and tricks. But if you step into the elevator, you may not see a button for the 13th floor because superstitious people believe that the number 13 is unlucky. We accept this as normal. Oh, uh, there's no 13. We just say it like it's, uh, it's expected. Not that it's ridiculous. You can walk outside and count the floors, right? There's a 13th floor. One, two, three, all the way to 13. They just call it something else. Ridiculous. We live in a world where people will drive 10 miles in a car to run five miles on a treadmill. <laughs> Explain this to me. We live in a world where passengers on a two-hour flight will pay an extra $1,000 for a slightly larger seat, a warm towel, a glass of wine, and for somebody to call them by their first name. Excuse me? <laughs> we live in a world that imposes the death penalty by lethal injection, but before they inject you with the deadly poison, prison workers are required by law to sterilize the needle. Ridiculous? We live in a world where Sirius XM Radio has a Playboy radio channel. <laughs> we live in a world where people see photos like this on the internet and immediately forward them to every friend and family member. Anybody have a chronic forwarder in your family? I know you do, don't lie. Everybody's got at least one. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, it's you. <laughs> this was the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami caught on camera, supposedly, just as the wave hit shore. Obviously a Photoshop fake. Did anyone bother to check to see if it was real? No, they forwarded it to a zillion people and said, you're not going to believe this amazing footage. This was supposedly the jet caught on camera right before it hit the first tower on September the 11th. It went viral. A Photoshop fake. Here's one of the proofs it was fake. Some smart ass took his cat, <laughs> did the same photograph. By the way, folks, Bill Gates wants to give you money. Just forward this email to everybody in your address book and you will receive a check for $1,000, no strings attached. How many of you have heard or seen this one or received it? A lot of you. How is this one still around? How is this particular little meme still floating? So thoroughly debunked, and yet I still see it. We've become numb, everybody. We're numb to the ridiculous. Especially when it comes to religion, tradition, superstition. For many, the more ridiculous it is, the more it must be true. I have faith. Growing up, I heard tales of Noah's Ark and Moses parting the Red Sea. I didn't see ridiculous. I saw the miraculous. Why wasn't I smart enough to tell the difference? Well, truthfully, it's quite often not about intelligence. It's about programming, almost always beginning at a very, very early age. And I see some of you nodding. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And Richard Dawkins was right. It is almost always determined by two factors. Where were we born? What was the religion of our parents? 
I held strongly to the Christian deity, the Christian holy book, the Christian churches, the Christian doctrine because I was born in Oklahoma to devoutly Christian parents. And growing up, I didn't stop to realize there was a child born in Utah raised by Mormon parents practicing Mormonism, and he was convinced that his religion was the right one and all the rest were ridiculous. As a kid in Mexico raised under Catholic parents practicing Catholicism, believed her religion was the absolute right one and all the others were ridiculous. <coughs> there was a child born in Saudi Arabia who prayed to Allah and adhered to Islam, convinced his religion was the right one and the rest were ridiculous. If there are any believers here within the sound of my voice, ask yourself a couple of honest questions and they're rhetorical, just consider them. Was I taught about my faith when I was very young? <coughs> Statistics uh, show that the vast majority of people who accept Jesus Christ to become Christians do so, two-thirds do so before they hit the age of 13. Ask yourself, was I very young? If I learned about my God as a child, was not believing ever an option? Did they ever say, well, find out for yourself, test me on this, check me. As you get older, if you get better information, let me know about that. Did parents tell that to their kids? Was I taken in by a religious person, family, church, or organization at a time when I was emotionally vulnerable? And quite frankly, a lot of churches who, in the best intention, will go after people who are recovering from addiction, or who have had abuse in their lives, or who are vulnerably, or emotionally vulnerable, and they will bring them in, right? They meet their physical needs, and then they will present to them the salvation message, or a come back to Jesus message. Were you emotionally vulnerable? Do I harbor a hidden or not so hidden fear of going to hell? This is huge. I get emails from all over the world from people who lose sleep at night about hell. They were told by their, their parents, you're going to burn. I've had people tell me that. What a horrible thing to say to somebody. I was in a conversation with someone last fall. I just stuck in my mind. I don't know why I pulled this one out of my, my hat. But um, when they learned about my website and the work that I do online in the podcast, their quote was, you're going to burn. Do I harbor a hidden or not so hidden fear of hell? And does that keep me with dealing with doubts, concerns, questions, and challenges that sometimes just pop into my head? Do I feel guilty for doubting sometimes? Like it's my fault. I failed. I should pray more. I should be reading the Bible more. I should witness more. I need to be a better Christian, a better Mormon, a better Catholic, a better Muslim, whatever. Even now, as I listen to this guy on stage, do I wonder if it's the influence of the evil one trying to deceive me? <laughs> Satan is using this man. You know, college campuses are where students go, and then their minds are filled with all sorts of stuff, and then they go home and reject everything that their parents raised, and their foundation is ripped apart. It's the work of Satan, and this man on stage is doing it to you right now. <laughs> when nobody's watching, am I fighting off growing fears that the things I do for religious reasons might be ridiculous? Carl Sagan once said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Bertrand Russell once said, if there were a God, I think it very unlikely that he would have such an uneasy vanity as to be offended by those who doubt his existence. So relax. It's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to have doubts. I did a video recently, if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll look it up, where my YouTube users submitted videos of themselves shot on their own webcams talking about how they dealt with doubt. And doubt is a beautiful thing. It's okay when you see Tim Tebow giving God the glory for his success as a pro football player while 30,000 people starve to death every single day. And you say, that's ridiculous. It's okay when you see human lives taken by tornadoes that ravage entire communities, and then you see the people who survive thanking Jesus that they weren't the ones killed horribly. And you say, that's ridiculous. What was the final death toll over this last run? I know there were 40 in just the last series of twisters. 
It's okay when the Pope is positioned and promoted as God's divinely appointed and divinely protected proxy here on earth, and you see him having to be carted around in a bulletproof Pope mobile for his own safety, and you say, that's ridiculous. I got some cheap laughs on my Facebook page with my own take on the Pope mobile. It says, always keep your Pope vacuum sealed for maximum freshness. <laughs> It's okay when you hear sermons and Bible stories about a six-day creation involving two naked people, an enchanted tree, and a talking snake. And you're told of a giant floating zoo built by 600-year-old humans in the Bronze Age. When you're presented with supposedly true tales of curses and spells and spirits and demon pigs and talking donkeys, the walking dead, parting seas, magic mud that cures blindness. Flying chariots of fire, supermen who gain super strength from the length of their hair. Men who survive underwater in the digestive system of a giant fish. And a benevolent God who would assert that he loves us more than anything else in the universe. But he will punish non-acceptance of his love with the most unimaginable eternal torture beyond anything we could possibly imagine. And you say out loud, that's ridiculous. Imagine it, a generation saying enough, enough, deciding nobody else is going to tell them what to think. Honestly, I don't ever want anyone else to receive their worldview from me or a presentation that I give. What I want, whatever you believe, however you believe it, I, I want you to get there on your own. Wouldn't it be nice to see a culture shifting where people refuse to be emotionally blackmailed by their own families. You've heard stories of this, haven't you? People separated emotionally, quite often physically, from their own families because they do not believe what their families believe. How tragic is that? But they stand strong anyway. They refuse to be blackmailed and they decide they are going to have a mind of their own. No longer feeling like they have to apologize for expecting sensible answers to legitimate questions. To be able to look at the irrational things we see every day in our communities, in our churches, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our political systems. <laughs> on our family trees, on our Facebook pages, everywhere and say out loud, just say it, that's ridiculous. I don't know about you folks, but that is a world that I really would like to live in. Where we evolve past the crazy traditions and the superstitions of primitive cultures. Where they're throwing babies off of rooftops to benefit the village. Where they're carting 50-foot penises through the middle of downtown for good luck. where they're not chopping the heads off of chickens to deal with their own inability to take responsibility for their own actions. To embrace science, skepticism, critical thinking, curiosity, reason, common sense, that world, my friends, would not be ridiculous. To me, that world would make perfect sense. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I very much appreciate it.